Well, good morning. This is Lou Rockwell, and what a delight and an honor it is to have as our guest this morning, Mr. Pat Buchanan. You know, I'd say that Pat is really the most famous conservative in America, and with good reason, maybe even in the Western world. I mean, he's a very significant figure. He served three presidents. He was twice the Republican Party nominee for president. He was the Reform Party nominee for president. He's the author of 10 very significant books, uh, and I'll mention his newest one in just a second. Of previous books, I'll just mention my three favorites, A Republic, Not an Empire, Where the Right Went Wrong, and especially his uh, very significant book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. So, Pat, you're a very wide-ranging intellectual. You're, I, I must say, folks, also, uh, if, if in the unlikely event you've not encountered Pat Buchanan as a writer, the minute you do... You'll just be drawn in, and uh, you won't be able to stop reading. So this is true of all his books, all his columns. Of course, we'll link to Pat's LRC archive with this podcast. But Pat, we're here this morning to talk about your latest book, The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose from Defeat to Create the New Majority. So you worked for Richard Nixon, both when he was a candidate and as president. Why was this man such a, a giant in American politics for so many decades? How did, how did that happen? How did he do it? Well, he was very fortunate in a way. He got, uh, he came out of the war at the same time Jack Kennedy did. He was four years older than Kennedy. He had gone to law school. And in 1946, he got the nomination for the Republican Party in California, back in, down in Orange County. And that was a real Republican year. The 80th Congress was formed, where the Republicans, for the first time since 32, took over both houses. So he came to Washington. He goes on to the House on American Activities Committee of Happy Memory. And then he uh, he nails, along with the help of Whitaker Chambers, Alger Hiss, an icon of the liberal establishment, as an American traitor and Soviet spy. And 19 by 1947, 48, he's the most famous congressman in America. Then and he gets nominated by both parties, and he wins in 48 in a landslide. And then in 50, he takes on Helen Gahagan Douglas and wins in the largest majority in the history of California. So there you got by four years, he's a he's a national figure in the Republican Party, a senator and a famous congressman. And because he endorsed Eisenhower over Taft in, in 1952, he was picked for vice president, became the second youngest vice president in history, and then became the most active and famous going to Moscow, debating Khrushchev in the kitchen debate, being stoned in Caracas by mobs, handling himself well during Ike's various severe illnesses when he was acting president. So by 1960, then he lost to JFK in a famous election, and Kennedy, of course, became a legendary figure when he was assassinated. And Nixon uh, lost in 62 and had his famous press conference. So by the time I arrived in 1965, he had been 18 years in national politics and was was really world famous. And uh, he was still a relatively young man uh, in his middle 50s or early to middle 50s. Was that 1960 election stolen from Nixon? It did, indeed. I think that if in both uh, Illinois, the, you know, the graveyard wards really turned out well that year. And you got in Texas with Lyndon Johnson, landslide Lyndon. And it was such a narrow, close election that it was widely believed there was vote theft, massive vote theft in Illinois and Texas, and maybe Missouri, all of which were crucial to Kennedy's election. Uh, even Kennedy himself joked about his father's capacities to to basically buy votes when he said uh, he'd gotten a telegram was from his father during the West Virginia primary. And his father had written him, um, don't buy a single more vote than is needed. I'll be damned if I'll pay for a landslide. <laughs> After, you know, this tremendous string of victories, then he's defeated in, in 1960. And I think most Republicans uh, then as now uh, agree with you that the election was stolen. What happened in 62 when he was defeated for governor of California? Well, I think he went out there to run for governor of California, and it was widely believed, and, and with some cause, that Nixon was running to gain the governorship, to have a place to stand, to sit, basically, and, and avoid the 64 race, and that if he became governor, he would be perfectly situated, California becoming the first state in the Union uh, in terms of population, to run in 67, 68. And during the missile crisis, he was making a surge, and during the missile crisis, his his movement was stopped and halted, and he was beaten soundly by Governor Pat Brown. 
And after that, he went out and had his famous last press conferences where he says, uh, think of all the fun you guys are going to be missing to the press. You won't have Nixon to pick around anymore because this is my last press conference. And he quit politics and walked out, moved to New York, joined a law firm there, and was basically out of politics until he was invited to deliver the address uh, for Barry Goldwater, introducing him at that famous convention at the Cow Palace in 64. I know that he gained the uh, respect of conservatives at that time. I was involved in the Goldwater campaign myself, obviously at a very low level, because he campaigned so hard for Goldwater, even though he came from a different wing of the party. I think even Nixon's worst enemies would have to concede is he was a loyalist to the party. He was constantly trying to pull it together, and he was a fighter. And he not only spoke on behalf of Goldwater, and, and Nixon had been sort of part of a cabal, I think, at that Cleveland Governor's Conference that tried to derail Goldwater. But once Nixon saw he had the nomination, he introduced him at the convention, then he went out and campaigned for Goldwater, harder than Goldwater campaigned for himself. And Nixon was fortunate in the fact that his opponents, like Rockefeller and Romney and Scranton and the others, Really, uh, they they not they they gutted Goldwater at his convention, and then they walked away from him and refused to support him. And so Nixon ended the '64 campaign. The Republican Party was down to 140 House seats. It was really shattered. But Nixon was seen as someone who had really stood by them in this picket's charge of the American right. And there were a tremendous number of conservatives who said, you know, I don't I don't like the campaign he ran in 1960, but the guy was with us when we really needed him. And Nixon understood that, and I think he would have campaigned anyhow, but it was clearly to his benefit to do so. And then, Lou, when I joined up in 65, early 66, January, uh, he was preparing to campaign again all out to help the party rebuild its base from those 140 seats. And he campaigned for five or six weeks in every congressional district they asked him to come into. And the party won a tremendous victory, 47 seats, as I mentioned, and three senators and eight new governors. And then at the end of it, LBJ <laughs> launched a tirade against Nixon as a chronic campaigner for for questioning his, uh, his foreign policy activity in Vietnam. And Nixon handled it beautifully. And then uh, he was clearly seen as the victor over LBJ. Then he masterfully dropped out of politics for a year. Well, and this is when you were working for him. In 65, all the way through and writing columns with him and, and handling his mail and traveling with him and putting together, basically, putting together what the what I thought was the winning coalition in 60, 68. It just suggested itself. Win over the Goldwater conservatives, bring the Goldwater conservatives into camp, tie them together with the Nixon centrists in the party, the folks in Indiana and Nebraska and, and out in middle America who always liked Nixon, respected him, but thought he was a loser, and bring these two groups together. And there was no way the left wing of the Republican Party, the establishment wing, which had been routed in 1964, could win the nomination. And Romney was the one candidate they had who seemed to have across the party appeal and Romney, soon after 66, Lou, he went out and, I mean, he stepped in every cow pie in the pasture in his first three months out there until where the point he had started in November is eight points ahead of Johnson and far ahead of Nixon, who ran second. But within four months, uh, Nixon had moved back into the lead among Republicans. And the, the, the establishment wing of the Republican Party was in trouble because it selected designated candidate who was going to be first in the lists against Nixon was Romney. And it was clear that the national press had concluded Romney didn't have it. You know, was it, uh, I always remember Romney's uh, comment, which of course sunk him, although I I thought it was uh, had something to it when he said that the Pentagon had brainwashed him on the Vietnam War. Well, the Pentagon and the diplomatic corps as well. Henry Cabot Lodge over there. <laughs> That's um, right. But but what it, the problem with with the comment was that uh, it fit in perfectly with Romney's performance on the on the campaign trail. You know, of course, he, he should have said tried to brainwash him. Yeah, he said, well, here's the thing, exactly. Uh, but he came back and he had said one thing, and now he had changed his mind dramatically and said the reason I was saying those things is I'd been brainwashed over there. And so, as Gene McCarthy said, you know, in Romney's case, it was not necessary to do a full <laughs> brainwashing. A, a light rinse would have sufficed. <laughs> and so he had that, he was carrying that with him. And 
I mean, he had the the baggage of the, and we we didn't let the folks forget it. He had the baggage of never having, not having supported Goldwater, actually of having gutted gutted him, and Goldwater was very bitter with Rockefeller and Romney, and he had that, and then he had performed badly, and he was on the sort of the liberal wing of the party, so he carried a lot of baggage into New Hampshire. We had private polls showing us beating him four to one before we got up there. Wow. And that's one reason Nixon, we didn't go up there until February 1, 1968, six weeks before Election Day. Wow. And uh, Nixon, of course, went on to uh, to triumph. Yeah, he won every primary, won every single primary. They they wouldn't go in against him, and understandably, because he was tremendously strong in the party. And then he had the conservatives now pretty well locked up. We had polls showing us beating Reagan. And it's a much more poll, and I've been unable to find it again. I had it in my file somewhere here, showing Reagan beating him about he beaten Reagan about fifty eight to fifty five to ten or something among California Republicans for the nomination for president. Reagan was very popular as a governor, but the folks in California had yet to come to see him as a president. And Nixon was was very very popular then in California. He carried it uh, every all five times he was on a national ticket. Was Nixon the smartest guy you ever encountered in politics, or certainly one of the smartest? Oh, certainly. Certainly. He was uh, extremely intelligent, uh, politically savvy. He read and studied and uh, discussed this all day long. He was into this. He he wanted to know everything. I recall even in, late in his life, he calls me up and he said, Buchanan, what is this battle with in which you were involved between you and these neoconservatives? What is that all about? <laughs> <laughs> I said, let me explain it. It'll take a while, sir. <laughs> but he was, I mean, here he is very late in life, you know, getting close to his 80s and tremendously interested in the ideological and political struggles and the personal struggles. He would come down even after he left the White House and he would go, I think it was at Washington Circle, was it? Anyhow, this hotel on a small circle, I think just on somewhere upper Pennsylvania Avenue. And he would invite me over, and, and he would sit there for an hour sort of grilling me back and forth on what is going on in Washington, in the White House, and in politics. And I would go out, and some foreign policy uh, fellow would come walking in, and he'd be grilling him. He really was, his whole life was a student and a scholar, uh, as I say, extremely intelligent. I mean, um, you know, Reagan, I worked for Ronald Reagan for, for two years in the White House. He was a wonderful man, personally. And uh, and I think he had sort of a set ideas, which were in many ways traditional conservatives that he thought conservatism that he followed. But Nixon, I think, was was uh, I mean, in terms of a student of politics and issues and philosophies and things, was uh, uh, he was uh, he was he was far far different than uh, uh, than Ronald Reagan. But you could never accuse Nixon of being a traditional conservative. I mean, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Uh... You no, know, he wasn't. No, you cannot. He was not as I was. I was a Goldwater conservative in those days, and and many of the and, and I've got a new. Hopefully, I'll get to write the book on the White House years where, uh, you know, I was often and very often in the minority in the White House, battling against various policy prescriptions. And Nixon was a conservative in the in the old sense. I think the small C conservative before the conservative movement came up in the late 50s and early 1960s and took over the GOP at the Cow Palace, where you were. Uh, he was a small-c conservative, anti-communist. Uh, he was part of that group, uh, you know, where M McCarthy's name is the most famous, but Nixon was actually the most successful anti-communist in terms of having survived um, the counterattacks from the left. And he was conservative in the sense when you had the social, cultural, moral revolutions and the anti-war revolution, and the civil rights demonstrations and the riots and the crime of the 1960s, that he could stand up and credibly be a representative of American traditional views and values and law and order, and not, not ideological, but just simply representative of it and articulating its views. His most successful speech, of course, was the great silent majority speech, where he simply waited for the demonstrators. You got half a million of them around the White House. And he goes to the country and said, look, uh, I want you to stand with me for peace with honor in Vietnam. We are bringing the troops out, but I'm not going to cut and run. I'm not going to be driven out of here by these demonstrators. And I want the great silent majority to stand with me. He went to 68% in the polls, which was an extraordinary figure for Nixon, the highest he ever received. And uh, then when Agnew took on the media, the country rallied to that. 
and so in that sense, they were small C conservatives. But uh, but I'll tell you, when I went into the White House, I've been trying to think of it. There was, you know, Lou, in terms of a movement conservative, you know, I was I was just about it. No, I'm I'm sure that's true. And in fact, if we look at his policies as president, he was not exactly a small government guy, Richard Dixon. Wage and price controls. <laughs> You know, he had he he cut the dollar loose from gold. Of course, I I didn't disagree with that because the Europeans were turning in all their dollars and were going to clean out Fort Knox. But then he imposed wage price freeze and wage and price controls. Uh, there's no doubt he created EPA, the Cancer Institute, OSHA. Uh, he did end the draft, created the Volunteer Army, which we had promised to do. He indexed Social Security. He had the uh, he opened up China to the West, which I thought was, a, you know, overall in the end, a good move, although I was very wary of it at the time. He negotiated the arms control agreement with the Soviets. He saved Israel in the in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, he brought all the troops home from Vietnam, ended the war, brought the POWs home. Uh, if you take a look at his speech in Guam or his press conference there on a new foreign policy where we no longer fight the wars for our allies, but provide our friends and allies who are the victims of aggression with the wherewithal to fight it themselves, but they provide the troops. That sort of um, predated some of the arguments I was making after the Cold War was over. He was a brilliant guy. There are a number of us who think that because of his foreign policy, and I would say he was very right in terms of detente with the Soviet Union and the opening to China, he stirred up people who were unhappy with that. Do you think that Watergate was, in effect, a coup? I think Watergate was a coup d'etat in this sense. There's no doubt that the Nixon didn't know about the break-in at Watergate. He didn't know that uh, the so-called plumbers who were headed by my friend uh, Eagle Krogh, um, that they had broken into Ellsberg's office. Uh, he didn't know this. But after the, the break-in occurred around 17th of June, the guys who were involved, they Lydia and Hunt were not caught that night, but Liddy and Hunt were involved, and they went to their superiors, who apparently, Magruder and others who knew about it, and Dean, and they went to the White House within a matter of a couple of days, and or almost hours, and Nixon, I think, said, you know, carve out the guys who are going to have to take responsibility for this debacle, and they go, but let's see if we can save some of these other guys by telling the... Uh, the investigators, the CIA, to tell the FBI to stay out of this area. And that only lasted for a very brief period. But the tapes were running, and Nixon was was talking on those tapes. And eventually, when they were revealed, he had uh, they contradicted what he had said later in, in March of 1973 and beyond. And so the what happened was the liberal establishment that Nixon had defeated and crushed. Uh, we defeated it in 68 and 72. We crushed it. 49 states to one. Nixon was an enormously popular, enormously successful presidency, uh, foreign policy. Everyone was praising it. But the residual forces of the left, of the liberal establishment, they were buried in the bureaucracy. They controlled both houses of Congress still. They, dom they were dominant in the media. And all these engines went to work to bring him down. And he, as he said, I gave them a sword and they ran it right through me. You know, Pat, of uh, uh, from the Nixon from the Nixon years, the person I remember with uh, now passed on with the most affection uh, was Mrs. Nixon. I mean, she was oh, she was she lady. was a great lady, and uh, somehow doesn't get credit for that. But I especially she looks great as compared, compared to some of her successors. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that, <laughs> but that's right. I, you know, um, when I first went to work for Nixon, let me tell you what our our campaign consisted of. And this is January 1966, which would be uh, which would be comparable to January of this year, 2014. If you're running in 2016, I went into the office and it was Rosemary Woods. I was right next to Nixon's office, and I had the desk beside Rosemary's. And the other desk, which was away from the window, was uh, Mrs. Uh, Miss Ryan sat in it answering the phone. That was Patricia Ryan Nixon, Mrs. Nixon. And I remember a good story. One lady called up and said, I want to talk to President, uh, Vice President Nixon. She said, well, you know, I can't right now. He's very busy. Can I take a message? And the woman said, I'm a very good friend of Mrs. Nixon's. Now put me through. <laughs> But she was wonderful. I remember after my Watergate testimony, which came off very well. Yes, frankly, oh no, it uh, made you a star. A yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I came back to the White House and I was told to come over to the solarium, not the, the second floor room that uh, 
family room. And I got there, and Mrs. Nixon jumps up off the couch and waltzes me around the room. <laughs> she was really a neat lady. I really liked her. The, 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 I can remember in, uh, in 1960, I raised $3,000 for the Nixon campaign in Massachusetts as a kid. And uh, so that was a good deal of money in those days. And I, my reward that was a was, tremendous sum of money. My, my reward was to get to meet the vice president. So, I'm, of course, there's no security as compared to these days. So he's running out the back there late. He says, come on, Pat, come on, we're late. And uh, so she must have spent four or five, she stopped, maybe spent four or five minutes talking to me. And I was a total nobody, of course. Um, uh, so I, th I, I thought she was like a fairy godmother. I, I, uh, well, she's a very gracious uh, lady, and that's a prime example of it. She really was. Well, Pat, thanks. Uh, keep, keep writing. Write that next book. And uh, uh, when they, the Lord willing, I always say these days. <laughs> and when they, uh, when they let you get on television, keep keep doing that. You always uh, are very much a breath of fresh air on American television. That's for sure. And uh, well, your column, you much, and uh, obviously we are uh, uh, delighted to run it on LRC. And everybody, just let me mention Pat's most recent book. It's like everything he's ever written, a tre a trem just tremendously interesting and tremendously compelling. The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose from Defeat to Create the New Majority. Pat Buchanan, thanks for coming on today. Well, thank you, Lou. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you. <laughs>